Thank you. You can come stand over here with me. Can we begin? Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to um, remind everyone that next week uh, there will be an exhibit at the EC Gallery of the work of the Office of Venturi Rout and Scott Brown from Philadelphia. And that exhibit will open on Tuesday, March 18th. Um, gallery opens at 11 in the morning. And that evening, we will have a reception for Steve Eisenhower, who will be speaking here next Wednesday night. And uh, the receptions are 7, 7.30 in the evening till 10. We'd appreciate if some people would come and welcome Mr. Eisenhower. We've had two receptions in the past two weeks, and we really haven't had many students showing up, and not many of the public have been there. And we'd like to extend this invitation to you. Um, the reason for it is so that the public can come and meet the architects informally, and also that the students will have time to talk with them. So we'd appreciate if some people would come. Not everyone, but some people. Um, tonight, we're happy to present Jim Wines, he's partner in charge of Site Incorporated, a New York-based architecture and environmental arts firm. Jim was educated at Syracuse University and worked as a sculptor from 1955 to 1968, during which time he exhibited his work and received numerous grants and fellowships, including a Rome Prize and a Guggenheim in sculpture. In 1969, he began to experiment with new aspects of public art and in late 1970, he began the nonprofit organization of Site Incorporated in New York's Soho District. Since that time, Jim, along with Site, has been involved in exploring new ideas for the urban and suburban visual environment. The work of Site is divided into two categories. Site Projects, which is involved in the development of environmental art and architecture proposals, and On Site, which sponsors books as well as theoretical research and workshops, and acts as an international clearinghouse for environmental arts and projects in this country and internationally. And recently, they have had two shows in New York City at the Feldman Gallery and at the Museum of Modern Art. At present, their work is exhibited at the EC Gallery. It's basically a show involving projects done for the best company. And that uh, exhibit will be on through next Sunday. May I present Jim Wines? Well, thank you. Um, I also want to thank Jackie and particularly Ben Levine for preventing culture shock. I told Jackie before I got out here I didn't want to hit LA in both barrels. I didn't want it all at once. And so Ben's been taking me around for the last couple of days, you know, reviewing things like Schindler houses. And he, and in order to prevent culture shock, he did one dexterous thing. He took me to a section, believe it or not, of the Venice strip there where every single roller skater was over 55. And, I, and for that reason, I'm left standing. I don't think I could have taken what I know really probably exists on like on a hot Saturday afternoon. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you've got to remember that any New Yorker is, is duly impressed by the pulchritude of people out here. I mean, it's just it's almost overwhelming. Uh, this audience I might include are just looking around. Uh, it's a little bit like having the surf dashed in your face. I feel kind of <laughs> uh, Anyway, so I sort of 
apologize. I think I have to for my the gray complexion, but that's part of the game there. Uh, anyway, tonight I thought I thought I would like to discuss um, one unfortunate aspect of our work is that up until maybe the last year and a half, almost it's been exclusively written about everywhere else in the world except the United States. And it's started to get some attention here, I think belatedly. And if you've had occasion to read most of what has been written, it's such mindless trash that I can't believe it. So <laughs> I thought I would sort of try to put the try to explain some of the issues, or at least our purposes. I think that one thing I, I say as a cautionary measure, obviously architecture is a form of public art. So once you drop it out there, uh, and that's part of the fun as well, is that you expect the public to react on their own terms. And the public will never, for example, embrace the esoterica, which I will deliver tonight. But they will understand it on one level. And I've always been surprised, for example, that the reactions of people who had uh, these seemingly no sophistication or in architecture or architectural dialogue would come up with really rather poetic interpretations Whereas to the contrary, um, the architectural profession itself, um, in fact, I brought some commentary uh, tonight, uh, often is, is less, less patient uh, with our work. And, um, oh, I don't know, things like this. Um, Sight's work could better be described as a, from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I read with disbelief that article about Site Incorporated, which they had the list of names of readers that vehemently object against such atrocities and abominations. Uh, here's one. Does the uh, Site claims the power of the juxtaposition of the modestly familiar with the stunningly unfamiliar. This is precisely the root of psychologist D.O. Hebb's theory of fear. <laughs> uh, well, I won't belabor this, but there are things like given Given, love, given America's love affair with watching violence, decadent potential, sinister sense of humor, backdoor values, wasteland, sheer lunacy, tailor-made to incite the anarchistic tendencies of our society, <laughs> vandalism and property destruction tending towards nihilism. Uh, anyway, uh, as I said, I wanted to at least indicate that Perhaps behind all this, um, there is some sobering thoughts. And I thought in order to do that, probably the best way, and I, I'm sure this is a bit redundant for many of you who know what's happened in the last thousand years, but I thought it might be nice to put this in some kind of historical context. Because I think often when you're trying to create an argument, uh, which may, I think, to some seem preposterous, probably, I think it's probably good to have a nice historical foundation under it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as I say, kind of catapult through a lot of history, but at least to demonstrate certain value systems. I think we've all, for better or for worse, inherited the modern movement. And uh, we now do it so subconsciously that it, it's pervasive. I mean, no one thinks about these influences. No one, it's just simply, as you go around architecture schools, and by the way, I was surprised uh, just in a brief overview of projects in the school uh, at the amount of apparent thinking that was going on. I mean, there was a sense of liberation from some of these uh, interminable cliches that you see in practically every school in the country. So, uh, you know, and one of the reasons I, I, Jacqueline encouraged me to come here is that, and I've heard from many sources, is a very lively and, and, and kind of a thinking school. There is a dialogue potential here that I think is enormous. So I'm really, really quite happy to contribute to it. All right, let's uh, probably, I think we should, since there's some heavy stuff here, I want to get into it and uh, move on. Maybe I should take this off, sort of Mick Jagger. Uh, 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 I think I, I, I have to leave this on. Now, what do I have to leave on? What do I have to turn off? All right. All right. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, I like the simplicity of this. I was at um, Princeton one time, and they had this um, incredibly elaborate dashboard in front of me, in which you know it was like something like out of 747, in which you had to control everything. Uh, oh, I can't. It's all right. Uh, and you had to, you know, the the destiny of 
the entire performance was contingent upon the performer. And there were all of these buttons, you know, off um, auditorium lights, on stage lights, uh, you know, on camera, off camera. And finally, way down in the corner, I noticed these two little buttons. One was women's washroom and men's washroom. <laughs> and for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what you would want to do from the speaking speaker stand that would in any way affect it. And you know, all during this lecture, I was sort of tempted to, you know, kind of punch one <laughs> and see if he got a yell from backstage. <laughs> anyway, all right, let's uh, get in. Is this going to be too? All right. Yeah, I hope everybody can see the slides. Well, um, the question, of course, is one of relevance and iconography. Uh, historically, I mean, there really was no problem. Everyone, in a Gothic or Ro Romanesque or uh, Byzantine community worked, at least the architects and sculptors or architects and art, art and architecture were one and the same because it was, it, was, it was intrinsic to the context of the society and the building. You had a consensus community. Everyone basically agreed upon what the symbols were. And unlike this kind of pluralistic, disparate kind of society that we have now, they, they agreed. And therefore, it in a sense made the job easier. You could have a fusion of art and architecture like this, where really there was no difference between the two. They became one and the same. But as, of course, as time went on and you arrived at the Renaissance, what began to happen is that there began to be a clear separation. I think the advent, for example, of the private collector, somebody could literally lift the thing up and carry it home. Um, and you began to get this separation, where it was something distinctly called the work of sculpture or the art, and something, again, distinctly called the building. And I think that that, again, I'm skipping going very quickly just to make a point, but I think that cleavage, that separation between art and architecture was the beginning of the end. I think it was at once a liberating force for some kinds of thinking, but at the same time, in terms of iconography or in terms of buildings, you know, communicating or functioning as a public art, I think it was a problem. By the time you got around to the late Renaissance, something like this Mignola Papal Pla Palace, the building began to be, assume its own sculptural characteristics. I think in a building like this, you could see the advent of the building as an exercise in itself of form, space, and sculpture. The iconography, per se, at least applied iconography or intrinsic iconography, certainly has disappeared. I mean, it's not, it's more in decorative detail. It's not in a sense, making that kind of very strong social message or, or religious message anymore. The building itself becomes a kind of formal event. Of course, by the time you get to Frank Lloyd Wright, the, the decorative detailing is so submerged in the dynamism of the building. And then, of course, by the time you get to the Schroeder Schrader House, you have, in fact, a work of abstract art. And I think, for better or for worse, this is the dominant attitude. This is the pervasive way of thinking of a building. And that it, it is, people do not think, even the postmodernists, which would then will go back and apply something over this building, still fundamentally under this, and I, this is a point I'm getting to later, but I'm getting to it early to make it doubly strong, is the fact that it is the underlying substructure of all architecture is that it must be an exercise on one level or other of form, space, structure, light, shadow, and so forth. Uh, now, just another little capsule of history, and I think the really, this is probably part of a misreading. I think that the disciples of the modern movement or its influence perhaps really misread the real source of energy. And I think the source of energy is, in fact, where are the sources. I think that one of the crises, perhaps, now of architecture is that people turn to architecture for ideas rather than turn to the society itself. Now, with the Industrial Revolution, obviously, came a revolution not only of, of idea, of forms, but it also uh, of the entire social structure. Uh, you, you were going to suddenly liberate all these, uh, these masses, and they were, going to, they were going to work eight hours a day, and they were going to have all this leisure time. It, it was equated to optimism. Technology was the salvation of the world. And uh, the likelihood of then architecture being answerable to this sensibility, not only in terms of form and structure, but in the time of dynamism was inevitable. And it was, it, it was equated in the, in the popular conscience, probably very much as a Gothic cathedral in terms of the religious conscious of, consciousness of society. It was related in a very optimistic way. Technology definitely was, was in, keyed in in some sense or other to salvation. 
Now, the Villa Savoy, which is, uh, you know, needless to say, uh, God knows what the New York Five would be without this building. Uh, <laughs> in other words, uh, it is certainly one of the most influential structures. But again, I think the disciples have misread the building, probably. Uh, I think the basic fundamental problem is I think that they think of it as a cubist or formalist exercise alone, or it's at least been, it's been the easy way to interpret this building. I think probably Corbu was not at all turning to other architecture. We know for a fact he was not turning to other architecture for his sources. He was turning to this idea of the liberation of the technological era. And it was, he was really incredibly impressed with the fact that you could make a building literally like a factory, that a, the, the machine for a living in it. A building could become, in a sense, almost like a combustion engine. I think it's significant for the fact that these forms did not grow out of other architecture. They grew out of a living conviction, living sources, and a conviction that these sources would in somehow be the future. Uh, I think the conviction is to even demonstrate the fact that you know he, every time he photographed his houses, he put a Citroën next to it or had a dirigible flying overhead. He always made this kind of referential or metaphorical uh, connection between technology and the house. And I think what that is what made it intense. And that was the thing that I was most impressed with, because I'm really an anti-formalist by taste. And when I went to the Villa Savoy the first time, that, you know, I, I didn't know quite what to expect. This was about three or four years ago. I was thinking maybe I wouldn't like it. And not only did I like it, I, really, I was overwhelmed, not only because it was incredibly simple and dynamic, but also that I felt that its sources, particularly in terms of the time in which it was conceived, were alive. And, and that, in a sense, Corbusier probably had a kind of romantic ideology, really, more than certainly a formalistic one. Uh, the thing that, of course, that came from the interpretation of the Villa Savoy is the concept, of course, that a building is intrinsic unto itself. It's a work of sculpture that grows from the core outward, that the integrity of architecture, in other words, that the inside is an answerable on the outside. It's not honest architecture. It's not real architecture. That word real, we'll get to that later. All right. Uh, now, the unfortunate part is, and is that we got this kind of like, you know, handbook of cliches. I think what is really interesting, by the way, I mean, just, just, as, just as a side, I have a rather astute member of our office who does our models. And he said, well, this year, he says, I'm, I'm going to bet you $5 that I can anticipate almost exactly what the PA annual awards will look like. <laughs> I will draw them up in advance. And, and for every one that's right on target, you have to pay me $5. Well, he was, he, he was 100%, which is or 95%. I think it was one miss. I mean, you know, all the, you know, the, the rationalist processional stairways and the little notches with the column in it and the little you know, pu punctured windows. I mean, the whole bit, he anticipated it perfectly. And it was such a frightening omen to me that he could have outthought it before it even happened uh, that, you know, it, it became very impressive because, you know, you realize that these very recognizable stylistic innovations, what they try to do, I think, this, after all, was the product of an original artist style. It is not a typology. We'll talk about typologies later. I have a very strong reason to think that, the, that typologies cannot be made out of style. Styles are the way people conceive of things, the way they work spontaneously. Uh, you can only imitate their styles. Uh, I think that the most beautiful statement I ever heard on this, with this respect was Salvador Dali at um, the death of Marcel Duchamp uh, said that um, they, there were various tributes given to Duchamp uh, I, I remember Jasper Johns was that, uh, so he invented fire, but what else did he do? And, um, uh, but Dolly's I thought was the best. Uh, Dolly's, and of course Duchamp was one, again, a very ripped off artist. Uh, he said that the first person to compare the cheeks of a woman to a rose was obviously a poet, but the second person to do it was an idiot. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's something, it's cruel in a sense, but it's something that one definitely has to take into account. Uh, because I don't think that really you can take an, a, a source, I mean, and Corbusier is unfortunately a pervasive one, and then just go on endlessly doing it. I mean, I think we all certainly recognize that there is an endless procession of Corbusian uh, aesthetic just in virtually. I mean, the thing is that I, I'm always amazed at is when this kind of thing is done, if Corbusier had wanted to make them out of clapboard, he would have. 
but he didn't. And the reason he didn't, because they were much better in cement. I mean, he, much, he understood concrete. He understood that there was an action between the material and the choice and what he wanted to say and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, this thing with Corbu, and I'm just using Corbu as an example because he is so pervasive. I mean, you obviously have the La Tourette style, which went on too, you know, you have this, the Boston City Hall. This is the most ghastly one of all. <laughs> I mean, and this is my choice of the worst piece of architecture in the world, I mean, almost. <laughs> this is part of um, Rockefeller's Albany Mall. Uh, anyway, uh, then uh, you you have uh, the Chandigarh style, of course, which is also, uh, you know, reappearing and reappearing. This is the work of I. M. Pei. It appears in Pei and many others. And then you have uh, that marvelous 1954 um, uh, pavilion in Switzerland, which I guess is the liberation of high tech. Uh, here you have it, of course, the idea of hyperbolizing each duct and, and kind of releasing the internal, you know, usually hidden energy of the building. The, the services of the building suddenly become uh, manifest in the aesthetic. And again, as another contribution of an original artist at work then becomes part of a pervasive vocabulary. And you have it in Hardy Wholesome of Pfeiffer, and you even have it in, you know, technically the home sale at Macy's. I mean, you have <laughs> finally reducto absurdum of this kind of concept. Uh, so what I'm really saying is somehow under it all we have the villa. And I, you know, as much as I respect the villa, I, I wish it would rest in peace, and I think Corbu would probably prefer the same. Now, uh, just to <laughs> extend this uh, argument a little bit further, there are various factions, you know, uh, which with, of course, what these all-encompassing kind of big umbrella, which I guess everyone calls postmodernism now, there are the various factions which directly or indirectly stem from thread themselves through the modern movement. Uh, I think that in many cases, you know, with varying degrees of success. I don't think they're totally liberated, but I think that they're liberated to a degree. I think there is a distinct effort on the part of serious thinking architects to go to new sources, to find something beyond it, and to somehow escape that entrapment, that it, the, the very way of thinking of architecture. I think what I'm really trying to encourage is why do we think of architecture in such limited parameters? Why does it, why is there, quote, a real architecture and an unreal architecture? I mean, with, with all of these charlatans off to the side. Uh, anyway, um, this is a, in a sense a digression, but it's also, I think, important to define some of the positions. Structuralism really is basically a semiological position. In other words, I think the belief that there is an underlying language, a, a kind of thread, a, a language thread that runs through the history of all buildings in terms of, in terms of space or in terms of their abstract elements. Uh, I think they, many of the structuralists compare themselves to Chomsky and um, Wittgenstein and, you know, people who use it wrote about and thought about language. In other words, there is the surface structure or the signifiers, and then there's the understructure or deep structure, which is the signifieds. And I think there's a, a lot of activity. I probably the most intelligent, and I understand Peter's coming here next week, is, is certainly Peter Eisenman. I think of all the New York architects, he's certainly one of the ones I respect the most. He is a profound and astute thinker, as you will soon see, I'm sure. But his analyses uh, definitely um, you'd still root back through von Doesberg and they root back to the modern movement, even though I think he's about quite different things. I think he's expanding that language very seriously. Uh, the one thing that I disagree with Peter on is the fact that his work is in fact some parallel with conceptual art. I don't think that's true. I think conceptual art was far more radical in its premises. I think conceptual art was really art as a philosophical proposition, which in, a, in fact became a complete thing, a work of art like a, this Joseph Kosuth piece, which is in a sense the real broom, the analysis of the broom, and the literary or the dictionary description of a broom, the three dimensions, mental dimensions of the broom, uh, is really radicalizes art because what it is is obviously not a crafted painting of a broom, it's not about, it's not a picture of a broom, it's a philosophical proposition as a, as a visual, non-visual work of art. In other words, the kind of Mental process is important in this. I think that, unfortunately, conceptual architecture is more about buildings that just didn't get built. Because I think, again, when Peter builds them, you see, they become very formalistic. They become very, very much about space, form, structure, you know, and the values that, you know, are kind of time-tested. So I think he's fighting that problem. I don't know what, you know, what his lecture will be about, but I think it's an interesting tension because he's certainly one of the most intelligent thinkers around, and I, I, I'm interested to see what his new 
new thought thinking of that effort is. Um, of course, rationalism is you know, sweeping the European scene because, of course, it's a major defense against you know, having to change, in a sense, or having to address the future because you could see the incredible success of the past and uh, you, know, you can pull it up and uh, re re resurrect it, as it were. Another aspect of rationalism, of course, is its political side. Uh, many of the rationalists are Marxist-oriented. I think that what they really believe is that there's been a great disenfranchisement of the masses. In other words, the masses have not been the owners or the, um, or the creators of the city. It's been really the capitalist few that have, in fact, defined what the rest of us will live in, and that, in a sense, rationalism say that we must recapture the city. The purloined city must be recaptured by the people. And the architect's role is to provide a vocabulary which is universal enough to bridge social change and at the same time to bridge, uh, you know, psychological change. And, um, you know, I think that this drawing by the careers is indicative. You know, out of the ruins of the past, we will resurrect a future which is built upon that classical past. You know, you're, you're kind of super classicist. In a sense, also, there's a, a linguistic link to structuralism, I think, but it's a very vague one. I think it's much more in a sense of a kind of nostalgia for the resurrection of that historical period, as certainly these uh, drawings by uh, Leon Creer uh, recall. I mean, I, I think you've probably well, very well known about the great confrontation in Miami between the Creers and Frank Gehry and myself. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard the story, so I won't go into it. But uh, it all ended up with, uh, <laughs> with, with, with Frank, with Frank Gehry uh, referring to their work as pictured here as a bunch of mangers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it all broke down at the end, which it shouldn't have. We had no moderator, so it ended up in a name calling. And people were literally ripping at each other's lapels by the end of this dialogue. <laughs> um, a rationalist, I find, more interesting, I think, and uh, certainly if you've seen the new Domus, that magnificent um, baptistry, floating baptistry he did for Venice, is just incredible, really, uh, is um, Aldo Rossi, who, you know, he gains a level of mysticism, really, which is really very profound. Uh, I think it's based, of course, on de Chirico, and of course, on the, um, on the early rationalists, really, and even oddly enough, on some fascist ideas. Uh, one thing that Rossi definitely says, which I think makes sense, is that the historical monument or the place of the monument, both building and symbol, was, of course, religious. In other words, a, a church tower in the 15th century, his equivalent would be a smoke or a chimney today. In other words, the, the placement of the monument. You have to have a monument that is, in effect, readable in terms of the ideology of the society as a whole. And he's trying, again, to find kind of uh, some bridge, larger social bridge. Um, these are the Galateresi apartments. Uh, this is the ones that bother me a little bit because they're really not unlike this kind of fascist design. Interesting enough, early fascist design had a lot of the ide idealism of uh, rationalist dialogue now. If you've read any of it, um, there's a good book on Italian rationalism, early rationalism out now in, in Italian. I, they translate it, or if you read Italian, it's very interesting from the standpoint of the incredible parallels in dialogue. And then finally, there's postmodernism, which I guess in some vocabularies, everything is grouped together. Now, postmodernism to me, when I first heard about it, was seen to me the most tempting of them because it seemed the most liberalized. Uh, and certainly, I had a tremendous respect for Robert Venturi, I think, who has probably written some of the most important uh, dialogue and architecture in the last 50 years. Uh, this is uh, a building which I guess could be quintessentially postmodernist, but it's also one of the most intelligent examples. Uh, the historical reference on this building is so perverse and so, in, so ironic, I mean, so masterfully done, I think more so than anyone else did it. I mean, you, you look at this, you know, Alberti split pediment and the incised arches and everything, you can see the, the references in the, in the Venturi building. But in, somehow in the Venturi, it becomes such a very immediate kind of building. It becomes a building for our time and not historical building, really. But anyway, they, when I first read the postmodernist <laughs> action words, you know, I felt a great kind of well of excitement go through me because, you know, I had, had, had read uh, Charles Jenks's writing. And, you know, Charles has a way of, you know, kind of getting you involved. You know, you, you, you somehow feel the surge go through you. And, um, you know, I read pluralism, contextualism, historicism, illusionism, and all these words, you know, they, you, you, you imagine them to be a much larger vision. And then you try to equate, you know, what kind of buildings will go with these, this kind of ideolo ideology. And, um, you know, it's a... Uh, a 
confused overlay. I mean, it's not altogether clear, I think, what's going on, because I don't think it's, it's clear to the architects themselves. I think Bob Stern is another one who's, you know, struggled with this problem. But I think, for example, it's interesting in this building where on one side, uh, it's in some senses like the Venturi incised historical reference. And on the other side, as if to say, well, you know, maybe I better not give up cubism too quick. You know, it inverts itself and becomes, in fact, a very formalistic building uh, without the same kind of commentary level as the facade. So it's an interesting kind of dialogue because I think it's a, it's a very unsteady dialogue at this point. Uh, graves, too. I mean, uh, these are the various levels of reference in, the, in, in a graves building now. Our, they somehow all together don't fix in the mind like, like the Villa Savoy. Like you've seen the Villa Savoy once, you'll never forget it. There isn't that kind of strong s decision because I think the sources are far more flaccid now. It isn't the fault of the architects. I think it's more the fault of just where do we stand? What can we do in a pluralist society? Uh, and this is Charles Morris, of course, uh, 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 piece in Atlanta, which again is a, is a very flamboyant example, of, you know, a very bold uh, decision on the part. I mean, it's a, it's a courageous decision for an architect to do something like this. It really is because it's, I mean, uh, 10 years ago, this would have been unthinkable. So you have to really realize, you have to respect the kind of power of, uh, that, you know, it took to really, to bring this thing off. But anyway, uh, one thing that definitely bothered me is that, you know, architects are beginning to get into the news and, um, time they decided to kind of make stars out of architects. And it's only been in the last few years that I, I, I'm sure you're all aware that, you know, Hollywood has invaded architecture. And, um, you know, I read this thing um, and I said, my God, you know, this like um, the postmodernist action words. When I saw this cover, you know, again, my heart beat. Architects doing their own thing, you know, and I, well, you know, I thought perhaps there was some great undiscovered territory that Time Magazine was somebody in touch with that I wasn't in touch with. So I snapped open the pages and I found it was essentially the same buildings. That it basically the doing one's own thing had a lot to do with doing what we know very well because the forms, the kind of vocabulary, the references and everything were really pretty much what we've been familiar with for the last 50 years. So again, under it all, you know, is the Villa Savoy. And in a sense, I think that's what we're really talking tonight about. Is it possible to get rid of the Villa Savoy? Can we just perhaps, <laughs> you know, look at it with a certain amount of wistfulness, wishing perhaps that we could do it again, but perhaps, you know, never again to use a Pilotti. I had a class at Cooper uh, about two years ago, and I knew that I was in inheriting uh, John Hedduck's group, so I thought I would better clean, the, clean up the whole thing right off, clean up the situation right from the start. So what I did is I put all the Corbusian cliches. I just listed them all. We, I made sketches of them all. I said, anyone in this class caught using one of these <laughs> cliches and any of their work will be instantly failed. Well, I'd lost at least 13 students in, one, in the first round. I mean, they just, their faces went ashen white, you know, and I, and I, the ones that I retained, however, did some very interesting work because it was really hard to overcome. I mean, you just couldn't put a little barrel-shaped balcony on your building. You couldn't put a corkscrew through the middle and, you know, no <laughs> ramps. And, uh, you know, they really began to have to rethink the whole thing. Uh, now, one thing about postmodernism is I think that, again, it's, the, and I think this is unfortunate happened to architecture, is it never really got in touch with what happened in art. And I think there's been this kind of great cleavage between the two, and architecture has been, for the last 30 years, semi-asleep, whereas art has been really quite vital and very much involved with, with kind of meaningful issues, I think. And I think the reason is that this question of the word design, this idea of the designed building, I mean, they, that here under it, you have really the same essential, same old building, but by super graphics, somehow that becomes a, a, livelier, I, I'm not even sure what that's supposed to mean. I don't know why that has any effect. There's no substantial conceptual effect. There's nothing changing conceptually about a building like that. Now, one point that uh, Charles Jenks makes is that the element of metaphor in buildings is a very important one. I think that one would admit that a building like the Gaudi Casabatlo that reminds us, for example, of an anthro Pelagical phenomenon, or reminds us of uh, of something bones or flesh or, or or something anthropomorphic. I mean, there's some 
thing going on here. And it's that sense of metaphor, that sense of it looking like something else. Uh, for example, he used the um, uh, Ronchamp by uh, Le Corbusier, and then they drew this kind of graphic of the things that it reminds you of. And there's, <laughs> the building is effective because of these various metaphoric, and it reminds you of praying hands and a ship and a dove and a nun's coif and so forth. And, uh, you know, these, these references are obviously in the building, but I really don't think, uh, I think it's in a sense probably not quite there yet. I mean, I think, I think metaphor is important, but I think there's another dimension of meaning. Now, for example, the head of the bull by Picasso, I think it's a very important statement. That's a metaphorical, witty example of art. In other words, you obviously relate the handlebars of the bicycle and the bicycle seat as, you know, a, a metaphor. I mean, there's obviously that it is the head of a bull. On the other hand, you have somebody like Duchamp, who was about something <laughs> profoundly different. Uh, and again, his, again, for the first years of his career, he was obviously very much misunderstood. He was, they thought he was some kind of collagist, they thought he was some kind of buffoon, some kind of uh, prankster. Uh, his work was dismissed as not real art because, you know, obviously he didn't make it. Uh, now, I think that what we're really talking about, I think this is the crux of the whole evening, is can architecture, like art, make the real shift of the 20th century, which is the shift from physical to mental. In other words, the old art is physical. It's all about form, space, color. I mean, paintings were, had these values. These were inherent. I think what Duchamp really proved, above all other things, that there was a way of circumnavigating all of this and suddenly coming up with art as a semaphore of information. If you walked into an art gallery and you saw the urinal sitting there, now you obviously didn't approach it the same way you approach a Henry Moore. Uh, you either thought you'd walked into the wrong room <laughs> or you, uh, you have to address it as a kind of informational piece. In other words, what is this doing to me? Now, you can't look at it as a crafted object. What it really does is it's questioning the entire context. So the object itself is not so important. It's what the questions that it's establishing. And that's what I mean by that shift from physical to mental. And it's a very important thing, and I think that it really has to enter the field of architecture. OK, now that's the first uh, part of the argument. Now, the second part of the argument is let's see what architects really do. Uh, well, I think we probably recognize that they're sometimes a little deluded, too. I mean, I think that this kind of building probably, in terms of the energy crunch, will eventually be considered almost immoral because of the amount of air conditioning necessary to sustain it. But nevertheless, this is what really architects do. This is their, you know, kind of in the cliche sense, how an architect designs. And this is where people would really rather be. I mean, they have this love of congestion. I think that's the great thing about LA is it has preserved so much of its own congestion. <laughs> uh, again, this is the architect. This is, you know, the PA award winner, you know, you know the, the macho building standing out like a, like a, you know, the erection on the hillside, you know. <laughs> and uh, this is what architects design, and this is where people would really rather live. Uh, again, uh, this is a public space for the people. I mean, you know, this is, a, a, again, a San Francisco people <laughs> space. This is where people would really rather be. Again, you know, you, it, it's, they seem to have so little to do with each other, simply, I think, because architects have not investigated blacktops. I mean, you know, they really haven't investigated. I think Venturi certainly indicated this. Is they haven't investigated the parking lot as the piazza or so. Uh, again, uh, um, you know, architectural graphics versus people's graphics. Uh, again, you, you, I think these things have to be thought of. Now, I'm obviously being very simplistic and facetious here, but. Basically, these are very real questions. I mean, photographs don't lie, after all. And I think that they're very real questions that have to come into our perspective. I think the two words that architects hate the most are the ones that are most pervasive, and interestingly enough, in philosophy, which are indeterminacy, which is self-explanatory, and entropy, which is sort of entered philosophy via science, which is really the condition of degradation, really. I mean, that in a sense, what it's a scientific term which refers to the fact that matter and energy are degrading and everything's falling apart in effect, but nothing ever changes. And I think that people, we always regard that if everything's falling apart or if everything's declining, then things must be changing for the worse. That's not necessarily true. And it's just a matter of inverse philosophical thinking. Uh, I think it was Plekhanov, the Marxist thinker, said that uh, 
Negative thinking is simply positive thinking going in the other direction. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, funny thing is that these ideas have entered even popular consciousness. I mean, I, you know, I always say the barometer of America is my mother, and every time I want to find out if, what, my, what America's up to or into, you know, I can call up my mother and I can get a capsule. And uh, even my mother's aware of entropy now as, as, as a philosophical <laughs> force. And uh, therefore, you know, it, it really is a part of the American life. I mean, the old American optimism, it's gone. We have America's mood, hopeful, sort of. We have the mood of America is distrust. Now, these are all considered presumably negative situations, but they're very, very real factors. The condition of mistrust is also the condition of questioning, which I think you know, any art form should be about. Uh, you know, we, we, our, sus our suspicion of institutions, I mean, how we change our attitude towards institutional things. Um, the energy tangle, I mean, you know, certainly that, that's going to define everyone's future radically. Uh, and anyway, so what I'm really saying in summary is, you know, how are architects really, when it gets right down to it, how is the art form or the art of architecture, or architecture as an art, which I think it should be, uh, going to address this kind of very disparate, very pluralistic, combative, disordered society. I mean, there are no, you know, great iconographies. There's no unified iconography to draw upon, as I showed you in the great, you know, Gothic cathedral in the beginning, Chartres Cathedral. Uh, obviously, I don't think this is the route. I think that, that probably, again, this is part of the Rockefeller Albany Mall, and I don't think this is the route of architecture. I think that this, perhaps we can, you know, draw the X through it, and that probably is over, thank God, hopefully. What I think is perhaps significant alive and not completely understood is this question of what is the difference between art and design. I think design basically is a 20th century word, and you know, it's an arguable point, but I'm going to make it anyway because I think it, you know, it is, you know, one of those semantic difficulties. To me, art is a spontaneous kind of cultural thing that happens. In other words, it's ungoverned by rules or ungoverned by, by uh, at least the rules that uh, of pragmatism. It isn't answerable to any practical cause. It's a subconscious elevation of an idea that, that, that exists in society it somehow is released, something that's, that some subconscious idea that threads through the society. And as art is not definable in the same way. Design, on the other hand, usually has a specific problem in mind which it solves via aesthetic. It's kind of like a compromise of art in deference to the expedient, which is a different thing entirely. In other words, there's always the problem then the aesthetic comes in and helps you solve the problem in a, an attractive way, but it's never like art. It's never a cultural force. And I think the time has come, and I think historically, buildings were about the societies they existed within. I mean, a, a Gothic cathedral was indeed an unquestionably a work of art. It was never a work of design. I don't think anyone can think of that building as a design in, a thing, a design problem. And I think the thing we got to get rid of is that idea that it is in prob a problem or, you know, they tell you in class, what is the, quote, program or defend that fenestration, you know, that kind of thing. I think we've got to get rid of that completely and begin to conceive of it as an art form. After all, art and, and the sense of the abstract are the only thing that define us as human beings anyway. Otherwise, we just eat, sleep, and reproduce like the rest of the animals. And I think this is a very important point in elevating architecture to its rightful role, really. Uh, just to, again, to be simplistic about this, I think one would have to admit that Gaudi is an artist. I mean, the ideas, the sources of his ideas were the idea that essentially that a building could be a growing force, that building was, in a sense, an act of nature, that if a building grew like a plant, that it could come alive. I think the difference between a work of art and, again, a work of design is Caesar Pelli's uh, tower, uh, embassy tower. Now, I think Unfortunately, the look of these two buildings is different because obviously I'm, it looks like I'm saying, you know, buildings with lots of decoration are art and buildings without are not. And that's not true at all. I'm not making that simplistic an argument. What I'm really saying is it's a difference of attitude. This building's problem dominated or the conditions of problem dominated the resulting aesthetic. In other words, there was in fact a conditioning of the aesthetic to meet the problem. Uh, now, another thing that I think that, uh, you know, probably is very unfortunate is the reliance that many architects have on formalism and the idea that, you know, the cubism idea that that's the, apparently the only painterly movement that entered architecture and became influential. 
I don't think there's a self-respecting sculptor alive who got dead doing a piece of sculpture like this anymore. Yet, you know, every architect in the world wakes up in the morning, it seems to me, and does things that deal with this kind of, you know, let's work out the space. As if, in essentially, there's really nothing inherently interesting about a cube, a cone, a sphere, or a sphere, or whatever, or in combination. Basically, it can be, it can be, Louis Kahn, case in point, Corbusier, case in point, it can be elevated to the dimension of a kind of mystical meaning. It can have that kind of presence, but rarely. And I think that there, I think we've, we've come to believe that formalism can in fact be equated to art, and I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, so anyway, I'm, what I'm really saying, I'm making an argument in a sense now against the idea of the building as an intrinsic object uh, expressing itself or expressing architecture or expressing inherent architectural ideas or growing from the inside out, which is the formalist interpretation of Corbusier, to a really much earlier idea, which is the building invaded from without. In other words, instead of working from the inside out, you work from the outside in. In other words, the values, whatever they are, and those are the undefinables here, the difficulty, the values invade the building. Uh, okay, let's go to the next reel. I have to continue this. Is it going? Am I ready? No. All right, now, um, the second part, you know, I, I thought I would, since I've and essentially establish the argument. I thought in the second part, maybe I would discuss Seitz's work, obviously in the context of some of the ideas that I, the points I've made. It's quite obvious that we're not about form and space and structure, so we must be about something else. Now, what else could we be about? And um, I think that therein, that's the argument I will try to make now. So this is part of the first argument, but I think that you know it's very unfair to make this tremendous argument and then not you know at least face up to it and try to show how, at least on one level, you've tried to deal with some of the problems. Uh, well, everyone recognizes the basic building. I think that once historically buildings, and I established this argument in the beginning, became, you know, feasible. Once you could put a roof over your head and it didn't fall down, then the first thing one did was to give that building a dimension of a readability. Now, unfortunately, what's happened, of course, is the readability is, you know, dropped off in the, the little, you know, <laughs> sort of, uh, but I, I think I coined the word turd in the plaza, and I think it somehow <laughs> seems appropriate. Uh, but I think one must admit that there are values in this kind of building, perhaps, that don't exist in this kind of relationship between art and architecture. And unfortunately, this is, again, a pervasive one, the idea that, you know, if you, you, Nelson Rockefeller looks down from the tower and says, my God, it's, you know, empty down there, you know. And you call up the sculptor in Connecticut who has a thing that's too big for the studio, and you know, plop, it goes. <laughs> and uh, in, in a sense, you, you fulfilled your cultural obligation. And I think it's a really unfortunate way of, of thinking about that. The other way, and the much more intelligent way, of course, is the articulation of the space, the building as the work of sculpture, which we discussed. But this is really not what we're into. This is the product of that. And I think that one thing that at least sight is not into, is the articulation of space, except in the very simplest, the most minimal of terms. Uh, we're really not about, you know, chopping up people's private space. I mean, this, after all, is a much better building. No question. I mean, I think that for witness the longevity of some of the great palaces of Italy, which have had, you know, 50 different uses since their inception. And the reason for it is the spaces are basically big boxes with open spaces, and you can articulate them as you please. And the, there's a kind of possibility for the user of that space to, you know, change it if he wants to. I mean, there's nothing worse than having a fixed ramp right through your living room because it has some, some answer in cubism. I mean, that is not really, I think, necessarily what architecture is about. Um, in fact, the idea of typologies, and this is again going back to what I consider a real typology, are those ones that you inherit culturally. Everyone kind of knows what a house looks like. Everyone knows what a market looks like. Historically, everyone knew what the plan of the palace was supposed to be and the cruciform of the church. So what you did is you inherited the typology, then you invested the walls with cultural meaning. And I think that that is another very important thing that has to, it's again, it's a historical idea. I'm embracing this through history because I want to defend it in, the, in these terms. Uh, 
Now, modern architecture's answer to this was obviously to make the building into this piece of sculpture, which again, I think, you know, there's nothing about these forms that necessarily, other than their abstract relationships, really connects with the larger issues of society in any way. I think the best way, and I've, I've tried many ways on how to explain site's difference of attitude, and I think the best way is to explain it like this. This is a teacup. Now, a creative artist named Merritt Oppenheim invested the teacup with another level of meaning. She created the fur-lined teacup. <laughs> now, she didn't take a Ming Dynasty teacup to do this. You know, as Picasso says, you don't make art out of the Parthenon, you make art out of old shoes. She took an ordinary teacup. But what went with the teacup, or its typology, was all of the associations you have with it, the drinking out of it, the use of it, the familiarity of it, the history of it, the legacy, and so forth. It didn't have to be designed. It was already designed. What the artist did in this case was invested it with another dimension of meaning. Now, my argument is, if you took the fur line teacup and sent it to an average architect, what would they do with it? I guarantee you that they would shave it and then articulate it. <laughs> and in fact, they would probably give it electrolysis. They wouldn't even have a stubble. Uh, but that is the problem, and I think in a nutshell, I'm, I'm trying to see how I could possibly get this point through to people so I never have to argue. You know, people are always saying, well, you didn't design anything. And we said, yeah, that's right, because that wasn't the point. But I think that if we can get rid of this, we'll be liberating ourselves to other possibilities. Now, a uh, good example of that kind of liberation, certainly Jasper Johns. He said, the reason I use the American flag is because I didn't have to invent it. And that gave me the opportunity to operate on other levels. The same would be true of someone like Rauschenberg, who took a, his bed, put it on the wall, a few strokes of paint, and it became the thing, complete intact. It was a bed. Nobody could doubt that that was a bed. But it became then, in fact, a work of art. I mean, that transformation process, that mental process, was, in fact, what it was all about. All right, best products building. Everybody recognizes this kind of structure. They exist everywhere. Los Angeles has 500 million of them, if it has one. <laughs> Uh, it's a paradigm, it's a typology. We all know what the power of the marketplace is. Now, I thought, you know, you go in, you buy your housewares, and you go home. Nothing very exotic. It's a meeting place of people. It's, a pl it's where everyone is. As I say, if you're going to be a public artist, you might as well be where the people are. Um, now, to, again, go back to that point. What is the difference between art and design as an attitude? Uh, this is Cesar Pelli's Orbox building. Now, quite obviously, he had exactly the same problem, and he intelligently addressed it. He preserved the paradigm, he preserved this type of building, because if, you, if it didn't look like a shopping center, you wouldn't know what it was. If it, I mean, if it looked, like, someone like Paul Rudolph would try to make it look like La Tourette, you know, and, it, and you know, then you wouldn't know what it was and you wouldn't go in it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Pelly, on the other hand, had the intelligence to preserve that typology. He, 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 it looks like a shopping center. Now, as a designer, his purpose was, in effect, to add, you know, the strip of aluminum, to improve the logo, and so forth. That was a design decision. All right, now, site's ad attitude was complete. We took the typology, tacky little logo, awful little canopy. I mean, who could like a building like this? You know, I mean, it's like, I mean, you know, it's, but it's, there's something very true about it, something very real about it. I mean, you have to keep that or people won't know what it is. In its essence, it came, architecture becomes, in fact, the subject matter. And then obviously, we, these are the transformations we made. And, uh, you know, it obviously brings the building to another level of meaning. There's been a lot of misreading of this building as being, you know, a metaphor for destruction and ruin. And, and we're not about archaism, we're not about ruin, we're not about any of these things at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, unfortunately, uh, I made the big mistake. Uh, this is a scene from the movie Earthquake, by the way, uh, a city you all recognize. Um, the thing is that um, I, I made the unfortunate decision to title an early article of mine, The Iconography of Disaster. And what I was really talking about was anti-institutionalism. But nobody ever reads the article. They assume that after that point that our buildings are about ruin and disaster. They're not at all. We've never even thought about that, believe it or not. But we are interested in the fact that a movie like this, which is an anti-institutional movie in a sense. In other words, if you have to work in that bank tower all day long, there's no greater vicarious thrill than to go to the movies at night and watch it go up in smoke. 
and uh, and the architect with it. You know, I mean, you know, you watch Charlton Heston drop 40 floors. It gives you a sense of release. You know, uh, so that it's that sense of anti-institutionalism. I say, if there is in fact a unifying concept in our society, it's the fact that we don't trust the institutions. And I think that that perhaps is a meaningful iconography, or at least a, a key to an iconography. Um, and I think another thing about our work is that you know, I've always been fascinated by the fact that the American dream is all inclusive. You have like all laundry detergent, you have total cereal, you have most cereal, you have, you will never offend again, sure deodorant. I mean, and on a building name best, if you create doubt, you know, the element of tentativeness and doubt, you know, uh, it has another kind of cultural meaning, obviously. Uh, also, we revolutionized bricklaying. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, created a, a, a neighborhood symbol. I mean, it definitely has, 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 you have to see it in context. I mean, this is very important. Nobody ever sees it the way it was meant to be seen, you know, on the, on the Houston Strip. Uh, this building is a much more intimate st structure. Again, this is really about public art. I mean, you've always heard the story of let's integrate the arts. So in a, in a funny way, this is a, uh, you know, it integrates the arts by making not only a statement about doorways, but as you know, it's, the whole building is this typology. And the, and the idea is to try to do as little as possible, the least you could possibly do to the whole building, and you have to change the meaning of the total. And obviously, when you wake up in the morning, there's clothes, you know, you push the button, and bang, it slides apart, and then you have all the people, and you have the monument, and you have, you have the separation between, you know, monument and building. You have this kind of inside-outside dynamic, and you have this strange sense of, it's more about jigsaw puzzles, really. It's about, you know, you know that's the sculpture, you know that's the building, and when they're together, it's only that kind of suspicious fissure, and then when they're apart, they become each, you know, a living, different thing. And also public event, use of, I think it's very important that buildings be used by people for ver various things of their own, you know. Uh, this is the tilt in Baltimore. This is based on, you have to see the whole strip. This is the one building that you, uh, if you have to see any of our buildings, you have to see this one in reality, because it really makes a difference in the context. Because it's like 450 tons of concrete suspended in midair. Uh, Widelingers, by the way, are engineers, and they're, they're really terrific. They do very interesting, <laughs> interesting work. Uh, one thing that occurred to me is that, for example, now, you know, site has never won any kind of awards. And um, we're now getting kind of strange sort of honors from, from, na from governments. We got a, two government honors this year, which, which awarded us for our all over accomplishment, as if to say, you know, keep trying, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but we have never gotten anything. We never just entered something and they said, my God, that's an award winner. But now here's a building which, you know, endlessly praised for its sculptural dynamic, the great cut through space and everything, you know, and the masterpiece, every award in the book. And, you know, I went to see it, and I was peculiarly surprised because we have no formalistic intent, but I had to admit that, you know, our building in Baltimore, which is very near this building, in a sense, still it doesn't have that kind of dynamic with the, you know, the twist and the irony and all the other things. There is a kind of sculptural dynamic to this building, there's no question. And with the other reading as well. I mean, I think you have to admit that there's a way, you know, of seeing this building that is very peculiar to the circumstance and not in a formal, straightforward, you know, deep cut through space. Anyway, this is the troubleshooting kind of project. And it was the owner of the shopping center, which is uh, called National Shopping Centers. It's a um, chain of shopping centers. And they said, well, you know, do something, you know, with 250 feet of asphalt. And the only thing I wish, because this is an, another project that got an awful lot of abuse from architects, I wish the project had been given to 10 architects to see what they would have done without knowing what we did, because I think it's very important. Obviously what we did is we, since we believe in site orientation, we took the ingredients which already exist and just gave them a different d dimension of meaning. We, you know, we put the cars under the pavement rather than on it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it really uh, takes on a very <laughs> special kind of, of feeling. This, uh, you know, we always invent techniques for these things, and this was obviously, sp uh, we spray on asphalt and spray on, uh, we created this film, you know, and it was amazing because it, it was like an impressionist painting. It just clings to every little windshield wiper. I mean, you can see all, you see the windshield wipers and the details of the car. It creates an di interesting dynamic. It goes all the way across. Uh, it, uh, again, it has a strange mood to it. It's, um, this is when we're building it. Uh, 
we generally try to sneak our projects through. We try to try to get them through without people noticing. This was hard to do. Uh, this is working, putting them under the thing, and then it's again a community place. I mean, you know, people think of their own fantasies. <laughs> Uh, it has a nice, again, I think that uh, a part of the obligation of public art is, to, is to, to, again, connect with something that people subconsciously feel. I think that this, we always, people say, well, how do you get your ideas? Well, we always try, if possible, not only for our own esoteric reasons and all the rationales you heard tonight, which are, you know, probably mostly bullshit anyway. Uh, <laughs> But we really try to connect with some subconscious thing that we think people essentially feel. And I, it's a hard thing to do. You can't put your finger on it. But I think that, you know, I do admire uh, playwrights, for example, certain playwrights very much for that ability to capture Albie, Be uh, Samuel Beckett, who have been able to capture kind of an idea that's sort of submerged under the surface and then bring it into some kind of vision. And I think that that's a very important thing for architecture to do as well. The project has a kind of ominous quality too. It's like a prophetic because you see the moving cars go beyond the behind the ghost. You know, it's kind of a nice, nice feel to the thing. This is another asphalt. For, for example, in this project, by the way, we took advantage of the liquid aspect of asphalt in the materiality sense. And this one was for L.A. This never got built, by the way, as you probably know. We've gotten shot down in L.A. three times, and so we've, we're hoping we'll build something here someday. But this was surrounded by freeways. You could see it from the freeway, and uh, Santa Ana Freeway, I think, as a matter of fact. And uh, you look down on it, and it was just really to just ripple the uh, o parking lot right over. So when you saw it from the highway, you'd get this kind of strange, <laughs> you, know, you know. They were afraid that people would try to drive over it. It was actually too <laughs> steep. But um, we figured some, some California uh, bike nut would do it, you know. I mean, <laughs> he would, he would, he would, you know, would become a challenge in the, in the landscape. Uh, then we're dealing with other things, very simple things too. Scale reference, for example. Um, we, I've always been intrigued by, this is just, for example, simply an entry project. It's only about doorways. It's not really about buildings so much. But this is, a, you know, the best products company said, well, you can do some, there are some areas where you have virtually no budget at all. I mean, the, the simplest thing is only, the only possible thing. So we've been trying to work with elements that already exist again, but in different levels. Uh, and I've always thought it was very interesting, you could choose the level on which you want to address a building in terms of its size. And also it int does interesting things with perspective too, like when you see it going away from you, it gets bigger, you know, and, or radically smaller. And uh, again, it's just a very, very simple idea. But we're gonna do it probably in New Jersey because again, there, there's just no budget to do anything. This is uh, playing around with a floor plan. They, you know, they have a one-story version of their building. And um, we're doing one now where we're literally twisting the plan, just wrenching that plan and dropping two one-story buildings as a two-story building. So you'll get this odd, strange, you know, hang over. You will never know how to address the building. Again, it becomes rather kind of sculptural dynamic. Uh, these are just other different kinds of things. We did a, this is the only graphic, this is actually the only design project we ever did, really. Uh, but it is definitely that kind of project. But it was interesting. There was a community. On one side, we could have a big sign, a 30-foot sign. On the other side, we couldn't. Uh, because they wouldn't allow big signage. And so what we did is we, you know, the signage, as it goes into the other uh, county, you know, blurs out. So, you know, it's just great from the roadway because it's like you're reading it, you know, you can't read it anyway. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of corporate identity, you know, a large corporate identity. This is another kind of offbeat project. So it's really a uh, restoration project for a uh, 30s building. They, uh, that includes the camera barn. They said, well, you know, they wanted to upgrade the property and restore it or something. And I've always been intrigued that most restoration, all it does is destroy it or make it slicker. And so what we decided to do is encapsulate the building in its own glass wall. That is, there's a wall within the wall. It's like the Godard device of the film within the film. So the real people will stand outside looking at people who are photographed into the wall, you know, unreal people. And oh, that was one of the requirements. They wanted a people space. So we thought we, by putting the people there already, <laughs> you'll see, they would achieve that a dimension of people space. And it's also going to be nice because you'll 